As I drove home from work in the middle of the night, a crying woman covered in blood came running out of the forest. I saw her only milliseconds before she left the thick grove of trees on my right. Her eyes were wide and uncomprehending, her mouth open in a perpetual shriek, her clothes torn to rags. But otherwise, she was beautiful and young. I only saw the merest glimpse of a slender white leg before I instinctively turned the steering wheel all the way to the left, trying not to hit her. At the speed I was going, and with the constant rain falling down from the sky, I quickly lost control of the car. I missed her by mere inches as I swerved into the oncoming lane where, thankfully, no cars were coming. In slow motion, I saw the road pass by and then start to rise up to meet me as the car began to flip. I felt like I was in the air for minutes, but in reality, it was likely only fractions of a second. Then, the car landed, the black pavement rushing up to meet me, and my vision turned to blackness. I woke up suddenly in a white room, the walls seeming to be made of high-intensity LED lights. It was so bright and white that it almost hurt to look at them. I squinted my eyes slightly, and they slowly began to adjust to the overwhelming white light surrounding me. I stood up and looked around, rising off a bed made of the same kind of light. Where am I? I asked. No one answered. I began to walk forward, and a building began to materialize around me suddenly, the white light all draining out of the room like water running down a drain. I was in a castle, in the entryway, looking out massive black gated doors. I looked behind me and saw the bed was just a bench with flat pillows inscribed with roses and cherubs. The castle seemed to stretch forever in a straight line, hallways with endless mahogany doors disappearing to a point in the horizon. No one moved in the rooms or hallways. Outside, birds chirped pleasantly, and a tropical, sweet-smelling breeze blew past me. I turned my attention back to the front gate, deciding to go outside. As soon as I stepped outside the shade of the castle, a blazing sun warmed me. I instinctively put my arm above my eyes to dim the summer light. As my pupils constricted and I was able to see better, I realized that the light overhead was not coming from a sun, but many eyes looking down at me from the sky. They all sent out some light of their own, brighter than a full moon, but far dimmer than the actual sun. I could look up at them and see them moving, their pupils dilating and constricting as each eye focused on something new. They stayed in constant motion, and there were thousands of them, covering the sky with white sclera, grey, purple and green irises, and constantly flicking pupils as far as my eye could see. Those are the eyes of God, a voice behind me said. I turned and saw a beautiful woman there, holding out her hands towards me. She had green eyes that shone like emeralds, and a sweet, melodic voice that instantly calmed me. You are in heaven. You did it, you beautiful child. She came over and put a hand on my cheek. It burned with a touch, sending waves of happiness through my body. As I looked closer, I realized she had on platinum armor and a scabbard with an obsidian sword handle sticking out of the top. Tiny diamonds and emeralds decorated both the scabbard and the handle. This isn't like I imagined heaven to be, I said, looking at the trees all around us. They were covered in silver and gold, rising up hundreds of feet in the sky. They stood like skyscrapers, swaying slightly to and fro as the tropical breeze blew the smell of fruit and ocean through the air. 
At the top, I saw what looked like people moving around, flying even, but they were so high up I could barely make them out even when I squinted. Well, the truth is, she said, her smile widening from ear to ear, showing dozens of sharpened, blood-soaked teeth, her voice deepening and turning into a hissing gurgle. God killed himself to make this world and your world and everything in between. She brought her other hand up, and now the waves of pleasure I had felt were replaced with burning pain as she scratched me with huge talons that had suddenly exploded out of her fingers. Her skin began to blacken, but the eyes stayed green, expanding into circles of luminescent, very distant light between folds of black, rotted skin. Massive black wings unfurled behind her, squirming with millions of maggots that constantly fell to the ground, writhing as they tried to return home. The smell of the wings made me gag, reminding me of a combination of burning rubber and rotting roadkill. I screamed, clutching my cheek and feeling blood running down it in rivulets. I turned, running away from this monster as fast as I could. The eyes above me seemed to move faster, as if they had been agitated. At that moment, four people rushed down from the forest, waving swords and crossbows. They barely seemed to notice me, focusing entirely on the female shapeshifter behind me. She hissed at them like a snake, sending her long, forked tongue flicking out of her mouth and pulling her glowing sword from its scabbard. With a battle cry that made my ears ring, she rushed forward, slicing off the head of the man in front of me. I saw it fly across the air in slow motion, the man's body falling to its knees. He still had a look of surprise in his eyes when his head landed a few feet to the left of his body on the tropical white sands of the ground. The others wasted no time, using the distraction with a front sword wielding man to attack her ferociously. One shot her in the neck with a crossbow, the bolt piercing through and reminding me ludicrously of the bolts in the neck of Frankenstein's monster. She screamed with rage and pain as another rushed her from the left, swinging a massive broadsword at her jaw. Time seemed to slow down as their sword connected, cutting through the skin of the monster easily. As it penetrated deeper, sickly green light began to shoot out of the wound, and by the time he had fully decapitated her, the light was so blinding I could no longer look. We have to go, a woman screamed, pointing up to the tops of the massive trees. Looking up, I saw dozens of flying specks, looking like an agitated hornet's nest as they regrouped and began to approach. I squinted my eyes. I realized they were more of the black-skinned monstrosities coming to the aid of the one this group of humans had just killed. I doubted whether they would be able to help her. As one glance at her body showed me, her head hung on only by the spine and the associated ligaments and flesh in the back of the neck. She didn't move anymore, and the sickening green light had all evaporated. The maggots still swarmed, however, and voraciously began to move from the wings to the rest of the body. The woman grabbed my arm, forcing me to run into the forest with her. The rest of the group was ahead of us. I heard the shrill battle cry of the flying monsters landing behind us, but the woods were growing thicker and the constant sharp turns of the leading members of our group would make it harder to find us. After a couple of minutes of running, the shrieking and screaming falling further and further behind us, the man in front stopped suddenly. He opened up a camouflage tunnel, pushing aside some of the silver leaves that covered the top of it. The rest of the group jumped down, then the man gestured for me to jump down. The fall was only a few feet, and I realized there were torches burning in a cramped tunnel. I walked forward, hearing the man close the door and land just behind me, pushing me forward. 
We quickly came to a round room with a massive long table down the middle of it. Dozens of swords, crossbows, daggers and tridents covered it. All seemed to glow with their own soft silver light. At the nearest end, the table was cleared and chairs were set up around a steaming pot. A chubby man ladled out bowls of delicious smelling stew, smelling of mint, rosemary, potatoes and beef. He motioned for us to come sit down and eat. I hadn't realized it until then, but I was absolutely ravenous. They introduced themselves and we sat down to eat. They poured delicious smelling wines from crystal pitchers and I ate the beef stew and drank red wine as they told me everything. This is heaven, the chubby man said, sitting down on the bench across from me and pouring himself a glass of the wine. Or at least, it used to be. This isn't heaven like most people think of it anymore. Remember, I don't know all of this absolutely, but I've heard most of it from the angels and the others who have been here a long time, so at least most of it is true. You mean that shape-shifting monster? I began. He nodded. Those are the angels. They have become rabid and evil over the last few billion years, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Nearly 14 billion years ago, God killed himself to create the universe. He cut himself open and let eternal amounts of mass, energy and consciousness pour out of his body, an action which became known to us as the Big Bang. All of this matter had nowhere to go within God's body, so it created our universe instead. Now, God dying isn't like you or me dying, you understand? God dies very, very slowly. It is like he's been bleeding out this entire time. But now, he is truly close to death. In our universe's timeline, maybe another thousand years at most, and he will be gone. Once he goes, the entire universe as we know it will go too. It will instantly turn into blackness once the light of his consciousness no longer lights the stars and worlds of our universe. These angels here, they got an idea that if they fed the human souls in heaven to God's mouth, he would live slightly longer. And it seems to be working. Every time they feed him a few thousand souls, he seems to heal slightly. But he is still dying. At most, they might delay the end by a few centuries, but even that seems doubtful. The man shook his face, his jowls shaking slightly. You can't really die in heaven. Even if you get your head cut off, it'll grow back after a couple hours. But if they feed you to God's mouth, then you do, in essence, die. Your consciousness is digested by God and it is fed throughout his body, dissipating into the eternity within him. So, where is God's mouth? I asked. And all the people in the room looked at each other, a sour expression on their faces. It is at the end of heaven, the chubby man said, his eyes downcast. It is a horrible thing to behold. Trillions of gnashing teeth, endless insects infesting it and screaming in unison. Since his body began to fall apart, the insects of heaven have really begun to consume his flesh. I think it is driving God insane. A lot of the terrible things in our world might be arising from his insanity and dying. The wars, the mass killings. But that is just speculation. I don't know that for sure. At that moment, I heard a loud crash outside. Shouts and running from above us made everyone deathly silent. Then, the hidden trapdoor leading down here was flung open, and angels began pouring down the opening, carrying glowing swords and crossbows. They instantly attacked, dozens more coming from behind them. They slashed at the chef, 
He absurdly raised his wine glass in front of him, as if that would stop the sword flying down towards his skull. But instead, it cleaved his face in two, and he fell backwards. Within seconds, everyone except me was moaning, dead or dying on the ground. I instinctively picked up my wooden bowl, spilling stew all over myself on the floor. The angels began to pull the hacked up bodies of the others they had murdered out. Then, approached me. Their dead, black eyes staring daggers at me as I backed against the dirt wall on the hidden shelter. Just as they had surrounded me, and one was raising his sword to cut me open, I began hearing sounds that didn't fit. Clear. Again. He's waking up. As the sword came down to my face, I suddenly opened my eyes, my other eyes, feeling the cold, damp pavement beneath my body. I looked around and saw myself surrounded by paramedics, a lifestyle helicopter loudly descending a hundred feet further down the road. I saw the woman who'd run out in front of my car in the back of an ambulance. I looked down and saw the wooden bowl in my hand still, cleaved in two by a sword, remnants of herbs and sauce still clinging to the inside of it. Then I closed my eyes and fell back asleep. The doctors at the hospital told me I had been clinically dead for five minutes. Apparently, the woman I'd almost hit was the latest victim of a serial killer. She had escaped from him and ran blindly into the road out of mortal terror. I didn't blame her in the least, and was simply glad I hadn't hit her. I still have the wooden bowl I brought back with me, and the slices of my cheek from that thing I encountered. Once I get out of here, I want to send the remnants of the bowl to a scientific institute to see what it is truly made out of. I have a feeling it is not a kind of wood anyone on earth has ever seen before. The vision of heaven I had received was the most disturbing thing of the entire experience. It truly changed my life, and not for the better. I wasn't afraid of dying before, but I certainly am now.